atherosclerosis, it's a disease in the tissue. And, and almost everything that lipid people talk about is in plasma. And if we don't understand the natural history of the disease, how can we construct a strategy to prevent it? And although much of my work has been on ApoB, the more important part, I think, has been on understanding how the natural history of atherosclerosis should direct our prevention strategy. And what that leads to is that every major guideline in the world bases their selection of subjects for statin prevention on the 10-year risk of disease. And, and that was a huge step forward in 1980 and 1990. But, but it totally, or not totally, but it, it, it very fundamentally makes prevention almost, of premature disease almost impossible. Do you want me to explain why? Yes, definitely. When you plug in the numbers to calculate somebody's risk for any of the risk algorithms, the American College of Cardiology 2019 AHA multi-society, you, you plug in numbers that belong to the that particular patient. And what comes out is what you think is the risk for that particular patient. And it, it actually isn't. But what drives that calculation is the age and the sex of that patient. Things like cholesterol, blood pressure, they contribute minimally to the actual calculation of 10-year risk. So what that means is if you're 35, well, there is even a risk calculator for you, but if you get to 40, almost everybody's risk is low at age 40. And it isn't until you get to about 55, 60, that risk gets you over the threshold for the American Prevention Guideline treatment. So prevention really starts at 55 to 60. But half, almost half, of all infarcts and strokes occur before the age of 60. So how can that be? What Starry and his colleagues established was for the first three decades or so of life, the disease begins, gets a foothold in the artery. But it's only in the fourth decade that you start to develop the lesions that can actually precipitate a clinical event. But risk is low, and yet the event rate is high. How can that possibly be? Well, the answer is stunningly obvious, which we published. There are a ton more people under 60 than over 60. So the rate of events is low, but the absolute number of events is high. That's problem number one. Problem number two is, say you get to 60 and you didn't have an event. Well, the disease was developing and extending during your 30s, 40s, and 50s. So by the time we start to try and prevent an event, the disease is well advanced in the arteries. That, to me, is a, are the two fatal flaws in the 10-year risk approach. And we, we published a paper pointing this out in, in JAMA Cardiology a few years ago. Board Nordisgard and his colleagues have done exactly the same thing with the European guidelines. The, you can't beat these numbers. So rather than what Steri taught me 
And it took some years before we could develop the methodology was that we should be basing prevention. Of course, risk is a good concept. Of course it is. But we should be selecting people also based on causes. I can measure your ApoB pretty precisely. I could measure your non-HDL cholesterol a little less precisely, but pretty well. And I know it's yours. When I calculate the risk, if I said, okay, Peter, you're my patient. You're a healthy guy. I calculate your risk is 4.1%. Now, what does that number mean? Is that your risk? Nope. It means that out of 100 people at 4.1%, 4.1 of them will have an infarct. But we know that within that category, there's a tremendous variance in real risk. Not everybody's at 4.1. Some are higher, some are lower, some are dead on. So if I had two risk algorithms, do you know the philosopher A.J. Ayer? No. The English, the logical positive? He, he was actually darn good on probability. And, and there's a real challenge predicting singular events. I'm either going to have an infarct in the next year or I'm not. It's not really a probability. So I either am or I'm not. And if, if one algorithm said I had a 10% risk and another one said I had a 15% or 20%, whether I have an infarct or not, both of them were right because they said there was sort of a chance you could and there was a far larger chance you wouldn't. When we say people have a risk should be treated with a risk above 7.5%. That means 92.5% of the time, nothing will happen. Well, that's not a great incentive, I think, for helping people understand what's truly going to happen. So the way we can deal with this and what we've done is develop what's called a causal benefit model, is we measure it, non-HL or ApoB, and, and we can project the risk over 20 or 30 years. If you're 30 years old, the period of time you should care about is up to age at least to 60. And so if you were in a group, let's say, and let's say I make you 35 again, and I say your chances of having an infarct or a stroke before you're 65 are 30%, now that's a number you can deal with. That's a number that has meaning. And we could also calculate how much the risk can be reduced by starting at age 35 or how much you lose by starting at age 45 or how much more you lose by starting at age 55. This podcast is for general informational purposes only and does not constitute the practice of medicine, nursing, or other professional healthcare services, including the giving of medical advice. No doctor-patient relationship is formed. The use of this information and the materials linked to this podcast is at the user's own risk. The content on this podcast is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Users should not disregard or delay in obtaining medical advice from any medical condition they have, and they should seek the assistance of their healthcare professionals for any such conditions. Finally, I take conflicts of interest very seriously. For all of my disclosures and the companies I invest in or advise, please visit peteratiamd.com forward slash about, where I keep an up-to-date and active list of such companies.